Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Ginny Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. On today's podcast, we speak with Gary Magenta, four-time author, customer experience guru, and senior vice president at Root Incorporated. Gary shares how allowing greater flexibility, being transparent, and giving more trust to your employees is contributing to higher engagement scores. Leaders of successful companies over the last eight months have demonstrated more empathy, more curiosity, and more humanity by getting face-to-face with their employees. Gary offers four questions that move management from yell and tell to being a partner who walks alongside his or her direct reports. Finally, Gary offers his hope that we will all use this time to treat each other with more humanity for generations to come. Hello and welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere with myself, Mitch Simon, on the West Coast and Ginny Mathis on the East Coast. And we are so excited to bring you today a special guest and a great friend of mine. It's Gary Magenta. Gary Magenta is a four-time author, customer experience guru, and senior vice president at Root Inc. Gary is a highly sought-after media resource and keynote speaker for client events, industry conferences, and business strategy and human resource seminars. So, hey, welcome, Gary. And uh, gosh, tell us what you're up to these days. Well, I think the most important thing, Mitch, is I'm on Central Time, so we have East Coast, Central Time, and West Coast all represented. Totally, and we're all awake. Wow, Mill mill America, yes, we're all awake. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, Ginny and Mitch, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. And um, the question is, uh, what am I up to these days? Well, like many of us, I am reinventing myself, my work, and really expanding my point of view and customer experience because the customer experience revolution is here, and it's here with a vengeance. Everything that was changing about customer experience has been accelerated by COVID-19. So we are in the thick of change when it comes to customer experience. Wow. You know, um, one of the things, you know, reason why we, we created this show, Gary, is to really look at what it means to run businesses from out of the office. And uh, it looks like we've been out, we've been out of the office for eight months. It looks like we're going to be out of the office for another at least eight months. And I'm just wondering, um, especially in the area of, of customer experience, what, what is on your mind on, on how leaders and managers and frontline workers um, can better handle this situation. Yeah. So, uh, Mitch, you know, you and I know each other for a long time, and you know that I like to be silly. It's sort of my number one superpower is to be a wise guy. And I have to tell you, in this answer, I have no wise guy. This is serious business. What's on my mind is how to help leaders, managers, and frontline workers to move through this change we're in and move through it quickly. And what what we've discovered is that everyone, and I mean everyone, needs to understand the why change, what is changing, and how do you want me specifically to change during these times? And in order to move fast, we know this, you need to have trust. And that's where some leaders and managers may need to change the actual way they engage their teams. And so if you think about it, we are now in a position where we don't see each other in a lot of cases every day. So we have to build trust to move fast and we need to do it in a distance or remote setting. And that's new to almost everybody. Okay. So what's, what's on my mind is helping those leaders, managers and frontline move quickly because if they don't, they can lose their businesses. Thanks, Gary. I'm going to go back to what you just said on the why change. And a lot of us think, a lot of us have, uh, thought that the why change is because I just got to change because of this pandemic. 
I'm just wondering, is there a, a bigger why, a different why that um, that you have have kind of internalized as to why we're going what we're going through right now? Yeah, I think uh, you make an excellent point or you allude to something that's really important. We're not changing because of the pandemic. We're changing because the needs, wants, and behaviors of our customers are changing. Now, the needs, wants, uh, uh, the needs, wants, and behaviors of our customers are always changing. Right now, the du jour reason why they're changing is because of the pandemic, but almost doesn't matter. And that's not to make light of the pandemic. We have to be agile enough to respond or even get ahead of the changing trends of our customers. And those changing trends are demographics, technology, competition, regulation, socioeconomics, political environment. All of those things are involved, not just pandemic. Right. Okay. And said, if I may ask one question, you said something about the building of trust as being so important. And I'm finding that folks, especially our customers, are um, wanting the things they've always wanted. Because if you look at what needs trust, or um, three things usually, you're consistent, you tell the truth, and you do what you say you're going to do. Now, those can be do, done down the hall, and they can be done on Zoom, and they can be done with your customer, and they can be done with the folks uh, uh, that um, report to you. So when you say trust, and we're responding to the customer, if you can talk a little more about that. Sure. So there is a very strong connection, Ginny, between building trust with your employee and the employee's ability to build trust with the customer. It almost takes us back to this sort of service profit chain from the 1970s. And, and Mitch is the only one old enough on this call to remember the 70s. But for everybody else, the 70s brought us something called the service profit chain. And basically what it says is that if you want to have a great customer experience, you've got to create a great employee experience. So when I, when I think about our managers, our people leaders today, our bosses, to use a word that I hate, we've got to think about creating an environment of trust with them through the three things you said, and today, lots of communication, in order for them to treat their customer the same way. Right. So simple terms, you want to build trust with your customer by being consistent uh, for example, um, telling them the truth, uh, those sort of things, we've got to create that type of transparency with our people. Totally. And yeah. that's that looks different today than it did eight months ago. In fact, if you're engaging your team and your customers the same way you did just eight months ago, you're doing it wrong. Exactly. <laughs> so tell us, Gary, uh, and just Gary, uh, about my age, I just wanted to... Uh, share with our listeners that uh, Gary does have a nice set of hair for radio. So I'm just going to move on, Gary, <laughs> and talk about uh, transparency. So what, what type of transparency is needed today that is different than it was eight months ago? Okay. So, you know, I think eight months ago, you looked at um, the ability to be in many cases in the same physical space. And there is a, uh, you're able to use your spidey senses in a very different way on both sides. Am I communicating well as a manager or a leader? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? And from a frontline perspective, do I believe what you're saying? Do I get a sense of transparency from you. We have new barricades up. So we've got our leaders must become face to face, even though they're not face to face. And transparency is not just the words you say, it's the actions you take, the way you deliver it, et cetera. So think about this. Transparency today means we have to tell people the truth, as Ginny said, and that is at the risk of of creating some fear and anxiety. People are wondering, do I have my job long-term? We have to let people know what we really think based on what we know today. Um, 
is our product and service going to be relevant moving forward? Well, if the answer is no, we have to say it. No, unless we change it. Uh, we have to engage people in those honest conversations. And to tie those two disparate thoughts together, we're talking about giving people more information when we're not sitting in front of them. And that information can cause tension and anxiety. So for people leaders, you've got to be face-to-face -face even when you're not face-to-face. -face. And, and I hope we get to talk about that a little bit more because there's some keys to doing that and doing it well. You know, I, I, want, to, I want to get to those keys, Gary. Um, you know what I'd like to, to discuss with you is to actually be more transparent at this time requires, obviously, as a, as a, as a boss, taking more risk. And a lot of um, a lot of the managers, bosses, leaders we're talking to out there seem to think that, whoa, you know, my people are really overburdened right now, and are in a sense of maybe in scarcity, or a sense of you know fear for their jobs, fear um, fear of like how are they going to take care of their kids? You know, being transparent right them is being transparent right now is probably the worst thing that I could do because I'm just going to um, you know scare them. And I just don't trust that they can, you know, handle the realities of what's going on today. What would you say to that, Gary? I'd say words that aren't right for family hour is Me my too. reaction. Okay. <laughs> so I'd, I'd call strong yes on that. But I understand it, right? There's an evolution going on of managers. It's been happening for quite some time. Yesterday's managers would yell and tell, here's what I want you to do differently. Do it now. And managers today are really more of uh, coaches. They're partners of their team. So let's think about this from a physicality standpoint, what that looks like. A boss is going to stand sort of above you, in front of you, looking down, telling you what to do. A great people leader today stands next to you as a partner and a collaborator to work through our plan on how to get from point A to point B. Well, if we're truly collaborative, if that managed today's people leader is acting like a coach you need to be able to really articulate that story. Here's where we're at today, and that may not be all that attractive. Here's where we want to go tomorrow. And by the way, there may not be any guarantees. But together, we have to figure out what that roadmap looks like from big picture all the way down to the new actions and behaviors that you're going to need to adopt. So transparency means telling the story in real terms with honesty, but giving people the security of a coach partner who's in it with you. You know, you're much more likely to take that first step on what may seem a dangerous or uncertain path if you've got a trusted partner next to you. And that's the role of the manager. Hey, I don't know if how we're going to come out on this, but we're going to figure it out together. I'm in. Hey, go naked and afraid on your own? Not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, um, great. And you basically summed up, Gary, your book, The Unbossy <laughs> Boss, uh, which is fantastic. And and I just wanted to ask you, what, I, what I'm hearing you say is that it's more of a partnership and it's, it's, it's more about transparency. But even more, Gary, you're saying that this is really about trust. So an unbossy boss would just immediately go into, look, I can trust you with the good stuff and I can trust you with, with the, let's say, negative stuff or the fearful stuff, or I'm not so sure you can handle this. What, what would you say if, if you had written the unbossy boss during this pandemic? Would it be any different or would you say you got to rush to trust even faster? So it's really interesting. I'm not the guy behind the speed to trust. Uh, that's somebody uh, very different uh, and, yes. and whose book, who's books sell a lot more than mine. But I'm actually yes. thumbing, thumbing through the Unbossy Boss right now to look for it specifically. But what I say in there is coaching is your primary role as today's leader. And you can't enter trusting without, you can't enter coaching without building trust. And so trust is a must 
for the coaching relationship. So speed of trust, absolutely the right concept. How do you do that? Well, it's interesting because everybody's different. There are people with a philosophy that says, I will trust you automatically until you prove me wrong. And there are others who say, I will not trust you until you prove yourself. As a people leader, you've got to take everybody as an individual. You've got to really sort of discover what they are passionate about, what their individual strengths are. In other words, you've got to invest in them and lean into them as an individual human being first, not just a, a employee. When you do that, I think you build trust quickly. Hey, I'm interested in you, your point of view, your passions, the experience you bring in from previous work, from your life, et cetera. So it's great managers, great people leaders, great coaches build trust by asking questions first before giving directive. By asking those questions, learning more about the person, their passions, their contributions, their point of view, you build trust because they feel heard. They're a great coach people leader today are active listeners and great questioners. Yeah. For, for you know me, the questions are at the heart of it. You then are inviting them to be part of the process that, that participation, you're not going to allow them to stand there and uh, stare at you to wait for the trust. They must, <laughs> Right. It doesn't so, happen through osmosis. Yeah, right. Right. So you must engage them. We're having discussions. We're having dialogue. Then it becomes theirs too. And going back to what you already said, safety. So That's you said excellent. theirs too. I love the way you just said it. It becomes theirs too. Mm -hmm. Also, um, we're in it together. We have mutual trust. And by the way, trust doesn't mean we always agree with each other. Could you, um, you know, it was interesting, Gary, I know we, uh, yesterday we were talking about this, going back to a podcast, I think our two podcasts ago, the, uh, and it was Anne Maltese who, who said that engagement rates have skyrocketed because managers are asking their employees this very difficult, uh, intricate, complicated question, which is, how are you doing? I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, are there other questions that you think would be very powerful for managers to be asking these days to really, to really build that trust between themselves and their teams? I have three answers happening simultaneously in my brain at the same time. So I'm going to take them in the order that I'd like, if that's okay, because I'm the guest. Is that all right? <laughs> yep. Go. You're the guest. <laughs> First, let's go to these, this question of engagement. No question that engagement is rising. The Gallup polls on engagement in North America have been flat to down for the last 30 years. Oh my goodness, with all the money we're spending on surveys and understanding what our people want, we haven't changed that damn score in 30 years in North America. It's disgraceful. So why is it going up now? Huh, maybe because we're giving people the flexibility that they need to live their lives and be a contributor. The idea of child care and elder care and personal care are not new, right? We all have to deal with that. And all of a sudden, now that people have the ability to say, I can take a phone call, feed the baby, and fold laundry at the same time. That's why engagement is going up. I need to get shit done in my life yep. and I can still contribute while I'm doing that. So if you ask me in an informal setting, why engagement's gone up is I have the flexibility to do that. And by the way, I can do it in gym shorts without an hour commute each way. So I think engagement has gone up is because we've trusted people to get their personal obligations fulfilled and their work obligations fulfilled in a way that's meaningful and convenient and flexible to them. That's my answer to the engagement question you didn't ask me. <laughs> then let's move on to, well, what is important to find out? Well, let's start with this because there are some good questions, but let's think about these four things. One is we need to demonstrate humanity. And you started, Mitch, the question by saying engagement scores may be up because managers are asking, how are you? 
I think we always ask each other, how are you? But it's sort of flip. Mm -hmm. Now it has meaning. How are you? Take care. Those things have a totally different meaning. So we have to dem demonstrate through individual inquiry, humanity. How are you? What's going on in your life? We have to demonstrate empathy. We have to offer flexibility, which I just talked about passionately. And we have to get face-to-face -face virtual style. And what that means is there's many things that are said with our eyes, with a lilt of our head, with a um, shrug of the shoulders that you can't necessarily pick up on the phone. Get on your, listen, we're all sick of these face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to be on Zoom all day and we love Zoom, no offense to Zoom. But when you're talking about getting with your people, let's get face-to-face, -face, FaceTime them. Look at the physicality that is oftentimes the output of the emotion that they're really going through because then you can say, oh my goodness, Mitch, you look tense. Oh my goodness, Mitch, I haven't seen you looking this healthy. It looks like you're outside walking. Wow, you look fit. You know, it's those sort of things that pick up on where people are. So humanity, for sure, how are you? Empathy, I know you have problems like the rest of us. I want to make sure that we're giving you the balance to achieve everything you need to achieve through flexibility and get face to face. And I'm going to give you one example. Uh, I'm not on FaceTime. I'm sorry, I'm not on Facebook, uh, and except for a sort of a business page, and I don't follow it. But I got a call the other day where someone said to me, oh, you got a great shout out from a, 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 a younger coworker of mine. And I said, oh, I didn't see the shout out. What did it say? And they said, kudos to Gary Magenta showing up as a great leader. When my baby was screaming in my lap during a business call, he said, I'm never, and I apologized. He said, you never need to apologize for trying to get your work done with a two-year-old in your lap. And um, that to me was just, how else would you treat a, a employee who was trying to work alone with a young child? And for me though, I think what she called out, which I'm appreciative of, is that there's humanity, empathy, flexibility, and face-to-face -face happening on that call. That for her as a 20-something mother with a mortgage and a full-time job and a husband working outside of the house, allowed her to show up at her best when it wasn't the best circumstances. And as a people leader, and believe me, I am highly flawed as a people leader. It was just a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, old enough to be a grandpa and sort of using that type of empathy. As um, our people leader today, when the dog barks, when the doorbell rings, when your kids are fighting in the background, these are not important matters. What's important is that that person is still showing up, uh -huh. trying to give their best. And we have to embrace that and appreciate that. So here are some questions you can ask, Mitch, which was your initial question to me. Yeah, it's about time, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> I'm used to being on stage by myself, this whole interaction. Yes, I know. I know, yeah, Gary. It's not your burden. <laughs> yeah. It's usually, so, the Gary, it's usually the Gary show. It's yeah. the Gary show. But you're welcome to join me today, Mitch and, and Ginny. Thank Here, you. Gosh. Here's, here's the questions. You got to date when you're demonstrating those that humanity, empathy, flexibility, and you're doing it face to face. Some of the questions you need to ask before you get to your agenda as a leader is Hey, Mitch, what's most important for you to talk about today? Because oftentimes the barriers to the work have nothing to do with the work. What's most important to talk to me about today is I think that my kid came home with COVID and I'm nervous because I've got a 70 year old mom who lives with us. Totally. Yeah. If you're preoccupied with that, Virginia, you can't get to the real stuff. So it's more important to talk about that than the new initiative today. Help your person get past that, right? Then the next thing is as they're talking, they'll get to a point where they've vented or they've shared. And instead of immediately responding with solution, the magic question always is, what else? And those two words with that question mark at the end of it, which happens in your voice, what else, is often where the pause happens, the person is required to think more, and the real heart or meat of a matter comes out. So 
at the risk of being repetitive, what's most important for you to talk about today or for us to talk about today? And what else? To me, I think are the top two questions out of the 12 questions that I offer in The Unbossy Boss. And in real time, my doorbell just rang. My deaf dog didn't bark, but this is what happens. If you heard that, we're just in, this is our life now. We got to be flexible. Right, right. And and one little uh, additional point we heard from another speaker. And if you don't ask those two questions, uh, people will start bringing up the topics they really want to talk about on the chat. <laughs> so there's this meeting within a meeting going on. So I, I'm going to one up you on that, Jenny. I totally agree. First of all, you're my new best friend and I totally agree. So here's where we go. We have a new sales leader in our organization at Root and she's lovely. And I, I think that she's the best because I also found her in the marketplace and brought her in. So of course she's the best, right? Um, if she's your pick, she's the best. Well, she's evolved her career in the last couple of years. She's now our sales leader and I'm just thrilled for her. She had her first call where she brought all the contributors together uh, for a conversation the other day. And we're all chatting in the Zoom uh, or WebEx, whatever it was. Wow, she's doing a great job. Kudos, Aubrey. Kudos, Aubrey. But then there was also a phone text conversation happening at the same time using even more direct conversation. Oh. Right. So at the end of the call, I said to her, Aubrey, I just want to let you know that the chat is exploding with how great you're doing, but even more importantly, the phone text, which is the subtext of the chat, which is the subtext of your meeting, says that you're just kicking ass and taking names. <laughs> right. And then the funny thing is, no one is saying that to her directly in the meeting. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody, right? Right. And I look at this and I say, she's juggling a new house, a new kid, a new position. Her husband's in grad school. I mean, I know the story. And this professional shows up and knocks it out of the park and nobody pipes up on the call and says it. You're 100% right, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Wow. wow. What, do you, what do you think that's about, Gary? Because I, mean, I know that you're... I know you as a human and you as a boss are just open book. Um, what does it say about... Um, just in general, people's ability to to speak freely, even on the appreciation side, when yeah. it's most needed right now. So here's, it's so interesting. It does go back to humanity, but I want to just share another concept with you. Um, and that's the one of, of the masks that we wear in the workplace. We wear masks of professionalism. We wear masks of status. We wear masks of hierarchy. We have all of these masks that prevent us from saying culture, um, prevents us from saying what we really want to say. Now, at Root, we have, I think, one of the best cultures I've ever experienced. That's why I'm there for 20 years. But still, I'm not sure uh, if people are comfortable always just interrupting a conversation as you would at dinner to say, dude, you're crushing it. Right. And so I like to think about um, business in two ways. One, organizations, businesses are just one big dysfunctional family. And every single one of us comes from a dysfunctional family. And if you say yours isn't, hang up from this podcast because you're a liar. Right? right. Every single one of us comes from a dysfunctional family. And in those dysfunctional families, we do two things at the dinner table we talk with our mouths full and we interrupt, we talk over each other, we interrupt, we chime in. We say what's on our mind in a lot of cases. Well, let's put those two things together. These meetings are just dinner with family. Businesses are dysfunctional families. Treat those conversations as dinner conversations where you're going to be in the moment and speak honestly. And let's get rid of the pretense. We spend more time with our coworkers than we do with our families. Let's have that transparency of thought and conversation at the dinner table. And that's the way I try to show up. Now, I'm also in HR more than, you know, most people, but it is the way <laughs> that I show up. Let's say what's on our mind. Here's the feedback that you should be getting as a people leader. I don't always agree with him or her, but I always know where they stand and what's on their mind. That's exactly. great. I love that. I love that. I think, yeah, every, um, you know, it's interesting, Gary, as you say that, 
many people are actually having having their business meetings while they're actually having dinner with their families. So it's 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 all kind of connecting. So your idea, I think it's it's time has really come. So the next question, Gary, is is just to point out that it's a new time. So managers and leaders in this pandemic should be asking questions that they should have asked before. You know, how are you doing? Um, you said, what's on your mind? What else? And so that's something that should have been spoken, but definitely needs to be spoken now. Now, on the other hand, employees or team members have most likely in the in the past, let's say these you know these engagement surveys, which have been flat. They've um, I think they've been flat because team members and employees haven't been asking questions or making requests that they should have or could have, or you know which would be more real and transparent. So my my question is. You know, what types of questions are team members, you know, they have it on their minds, but they're not asking. But, you know, you as Gary Magenta would say, you know, get your team members to ask these questions so we can really enhance the, the connectivity and the, and the realness of what it means to be on a, on a dispersed team. So the, the first big one. Again, I'll answer what I feel like answering, Mitch, okay? But sure. <laughs> the real one is why aren't they asking the questions, right? And it goes back to yeah. trust and transparency. So I just want to, for, for our audience, um, what we've got to handle first is why aren't they asking the questions? So everything we've talked about up until now should be there so that people feel comfortable asking questions. Then let's go to the next How do you, and then Gary, how do you create that? Well, I think it's everything we talked about. Humanity, empathy, flexibility, getting face to face, asking what's important for them, what else, all of those things that we talk, being a coach who stands next to you as a partner in discovery versus yell and tell, all of those lead to that trust that will then open up the questions. Trust, trust, and, and Ginny said it, is about safety, creating safety. And within safety, the walls come down and I feel free to ask questions that I'm not sure are right or not sure if it's my place. You know, we it, it, it breaks down the barriers. So everything right, right. we've talked about here, it's actually great ordering on your questions, uh, Mitch, a wise one. Um, when we're here now, we get to say, with that trust and those walls down, um, we, we want our people to, or I encourage the front line to ask questions like, what are the skills and capabilities that I need in order to be successful in this highly changing world? Great. Right. Tell me what, I, instead of waiting for you to tell me what I need to do differently, because by the way, as leaders, we don't always know yet. Uh, let me be comfortable as a frontline person to ask, what is it that I need to do differently? And then I really would would encourage our frontline to feel comfortable enough to say, do you believe that I can get there and be brutally honest with me? Because if not, I want to find a new way to contribute here or somewhere else. Do you have the belief and faith in me that I can get there? There is some, I live in a high rise in Chicago and evidently somebody has come into my condo that is now testing the fire system while we're doing this. Oh, this is and, perfect. and my wife is in the next room talking to them and I have a headset on and I have no idea what's going on, but that's what's happening. Um, and then these two questions, one may be a little bit redundant, but they go together. So what do you expect from me now that I understand your belief or not belief in my skill and capability? Now I, that I understand the capabilities, what do you expect from me, right? What are your expectations of me? And what can I expect from you as my leader? Mm, There you go. So I can get it down to really three. What are the skills and capabilities that I'll need moving forward? Do you believe I can get there? And what can I expect from you on this journey? That that is, you know, that, that question... It's fantastic, and, I'll, and and my my thoughts behind that is we we are in such a uh, point of uncertainty that for a for a leader to act, actually answer that question. So you know, if you were my front line and you asked me today, you know, what can I expect from you? And I immediately answered the question. I'm probably not telling you the truth, right? 
Agree. Well, you, know, you just, Mitch, can, I, I, I'm sorry I'm going to interrupt you uh, again. It's my show. Welcome to it. Mitch, you just said something so important. I don't want to skate over it. Leaders today so, must have the ability to say, I don't know. Yeah. Right. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I don't know, but I need your help in finding out. There you go. That's the one I love. Yeah, I, I go through this in the Unbossy Boss. Leaders today have to be able to say, I don't know. The sign of a weak leader is that they have an answer to every question. And boy, if you had an answer to every question, you shouldn't be the leader of this fortune company or this mom and pop shop. You should be a world leader. I love that. <laughs> Great quote. Now, if you, the, if, you the, yeah, if you have the answer to every question, you should be a world leader. I yeah. like that. <laughs> Now, I still haven't found a world leader who has the answers to every question. They don't either. Right. Right. Not. They don't either. Right, 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 right. We'd like to take this brief interruption to thank our sponsors and then get back to our program. We'd like to thank Marymount University, Arlington, Virginia, School of Business and Technology, Innovative Solutions, Upskilling for the What's Next Economy at marymount.edu. Oyster Organizational Development, dedicated to higher performance, business success, and leveraging teams at OysterOD.com. And WeJungo, a strategic people process consulting firm at WeJungo.com. All right. So, Gary, we're, um, I think we're going to wind it down here. And I wanted to ask you um, some final questions. And my, you know, my question really based on this conversation is... Um, you know, given the pandemic and given the fact that managers and leaders really need to start doing a better job of being more transparent and being more connected, what what is the greatest hope that you have for managers and leaders and humans, you know, given this new this new era, this new time, which will most likely be in for, you know, another maybe eight months or a year? What what do you what do you what is your greatest hope? Damn you, damn you, Mitch Simon, you're going to make me go out on a serious note. Boy, do yeah, I hate sorry that. About that. Okay. I know. So the serious note is my greatest hope is that even though we are coworkers, we're colleagues or employees and managers, however you want to term that, we are indeed human beings first. My greatest hope is that we continue to treat each other with that extra bit of care, empathy, humanity, flexibility that we've been demonstrating during this pandemic that has led to a rise in engagement that has allowed us to get to know people at their kitchen table and that we're able to extend that. We will have a vaccine. We will move past this, this virus and to make it worthwhile. Let me change that. That's not what I meant to say. To make sure that those people who have financially suffered, who have lost loved ones, um, have, who have lost their livelihoods and lives for this pandemic, to make sure that that didn't happen in vain, we must continue with that sense of humanity for generations to come. Otherwise, it's just going to have been enduring a really bad time as opposed to changing the way we work. And that's my greatest hope, that we extend this for generations to come. Many of our businesses have failed. We all, I've, I've had um, personal loss from the pandemic, challenging business times as many of us have. And I want to come out the other end of it knowing that we are providing better experiences for all as a result. Wow, that was great. That was great, Gary. I think we're yeah, going to go out on that. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. I think, so thank you. Um, thank you, Gary. I know that you are super busy and I really do appreciate uh, your friendship and I appreciate uh, your time on the podcast and, and the thought you put into uh, this podcast. Thank you. And Gary. I look forward thank to you. us reconnecting really soon. Thank you both. I love being here. And for those those people who made it through the entire podcast, you'll remember that Mitch said that I was follically challenged. What you can't see is that while Mitch is not follically challenged, all of his follicles are gray. So with that <laughs> note, I will say, uh, Mitch Simon, I love you, Virginia. It's been great to meet you. I will talk to you again, both uh, hopefully very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, all, all of our great listeners for another episode of Team Anywhere. Mm -hmm.